Hello, B here, and welcome back to biology. Wow, check out this turtle enjoying their spa day. This is a perfect win-win situation. The turtle gets their shell cleaned while the fish get a yummy meal. This relationship is an example of a symbiotic relationship, or a close relationship between two organisms within an ecosystem where at least one of the species benefits. All ecosystems rely on these relationships to thrive. In this lesson, we will learn about the different types of symbiotic relationships and how they affect the organisms involved. But before we get started, let's look at our goals for this lesson. By the end, you'll be able to describe and define symbiotic relationships, identify and explain the three main types of symbiotic relationships, apply their knowledge and understanding to real-world examples. The word symbiosis is from the Greek word for living together. This is a perfect description of what a symbiotic relationship is, a close and permanent relationship where two species live closely together and at least one benefits from the relationship. Symbiotic relationships are important because they help keep an ecosystem in balance and thriving. Ever hear the saying that too much of something is a bad thing? Well, the same is true for ecosystems, and symbiotic relationships help keep one species from overtaking an ecosystem. In this lesson, we are going to look at three types of symbiotic relationships, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Mutualism is when both organisms benefit from the relationship. In commensalism, one organism benefits while the other is unaffected, and in parasitism, one organism benefits while the other is harmed. What would you think of if you heard an agreement was mutual? It usually means that it was agreed upon by both parties involved. I guess you can say the same is true for the symbiotic relationship, mutualism. Mutualism is when both organisms in the relationship benefit. Now, this doesn't mean it is always an equal benefit, but there is a benefit to both organisms. There are many different types of mutualism. In this lesson, we will be focusing on five of them, obligate, facultative, trophic, defensive, and dispersive. Obligate mutualism is when both organisms are completely reliant on each other. Neither organism could survive without the other. An example of this type of mutualism is the relationship between the yucca plant and the moth. The yucca plant relies on the moth for pollination, and the moth relies on the yucca plant because its blossoms are a safe place for the moth to lay its eggs, and the larvae eat the seeds of the yucca plant for nourishment. Facultative mutualism is the opposite of obligate mutualism. In this relationship, the organisms benefit from their connection, but can each survive independently of each other. The turtle getting its shell cleaned in the video at the beginning of this lesson is a perfect example. Both the fish and the turtle benefit from this interaction, but they could survive without it. Trophic mutualism, also called resource-to-resource -resource mutualism, is when there is a transfer of energy or nutrients between the partners. A common example of this is when a fungi and a photosynthetic plant work together. The fungi provides nutrients to the plants through its roots, and the plants provide the fungi with much-needed carbon. We talked about this in a previous unit. If you remember, we learned that together, the fungi and plant involved in this mutualistic relationship are called lichen. Imagine being the predator of a boxer crab, and when you go to attack, you see that it is carrying stinging anemones in its claws. Would you still attack? 
chances are you would back away and find another source for dinner. This relationship between the boxer crab and the stinging anemones is an example of defensive mutualism. In this type of mutualism, one partner receives food and shelter in exchange for defending the other against predators and parasites. Honeybees and flowering plants demonstrate the final type of mutualism we will be discussing, dispersive mutualism. In this relationship, the honeybees receive nourishment from the nectar in flowering plants, while helping the plant by transporting its pollen to another plant. This particular relationship is extremely important. In fact, approximately 70 to 90% of the plants in the rainforest rely on this method of pollination. Check out that heron hitching a ride on the zebra's back. It's nature's carpool. The zebra doesn't seem to mind at all, and the heron gets a free ride. This is an example of commensalism. In commensalism, one partner benefits while the other one is unaffected. There are three types of commensalism. Inquilinism, metabioses, and forasy. Doesn't that little bird look right at home? Well, it should, because its home is right there in the trunk of the tree. This is a perfect example of inquilinism, or the type of commensalism when one organism uses another as a permanent home. Gastropods are known for the coiled shells they form to protect their soft bodies. Have you ever wondered what happens to their gorgeous shells when the snail dies? Sometimes they wash up on the beach, and some lucky beachgoers get to admire them, but often, hermit crabs move in. This relationship between the hermit crab and the dead snail's shell is an example of metabioses. In metabioses, one organism often deceased creates a suitable habitat for another organism. Have you ever looked closely at a picture of a humpback whale and noticed these bumps that look like shells all over its body? Well, these shells are actually filter-feeding crustaceans, called barnacles, that are hitching a ride on the whale. This type of commensalism is called forasy. Can you think of another example of forasy that we talked about in this video? The zebra and the heron. Mosquitoes! Those pesky little bugs are the worst. When they bite you, they get food in the form of your blood. But what do you get out of it? Nothing. All you get is an itchy bump, a small loss of blood, and sometimes you can even get a disease. The relationship between mosquitoes and humans is an example of parasitism. Parasitism is when one organism, the parasite, takes resources or nutrients from a host organism, harming them in the process. Parasites are smart, however, and they have evolved to harm but not kill their hosts. On the rare occasions that the host does die, it is a slow process. Why do you think this evolution happened? By only harming and not killing their hosts, or killing them but doing so very slowly, parasites are able to give their hosts enough time to reproduce in order to ensure that they will have access to a new host when the original does eventually die, or is too weak to support them. Another example of parasitism is the relationship between tapeworms and mammals. Tapeworms are segmented flatworms that attach to the inside of the intestines of their hosts. These worms feed by eating the host's partially digested food. This means that the host does not get their required nutrients. In humans, symptoms of a tapeworm infection include nausea, diarrhea, hunger pangs, extreme weight loss, and a loss of appetite. Luckily, there are antiparasitic medicines that someone can take if an infection does occur. 
Have you heard the concern about the honeybees dying? Ecologists believe that if honeybees die out, it will cause a collapse of many ecosystems. This might sound a little extreme, but it could be true. If there are no honeybees, then plants won't get pollinated, which means animals that eat those plants won't have any food, and up and up the food chain this will travel until a particular ecosystem collapses. Symbiotic relationships are important because they can be used to measure the health of an ecosystem. These relationships allow ecosystems to thrive, and if there is a change to an important symbiotic relationship, it can affect far more than just the two organisms involved. As we went through the lesson today, we learned the different types of symbiotic relationships. We learned that while all relationships aren't always equal, they are always important to the health of an ecosystem. In our next lesson, population growth, we will explore how population dynamics change and the factors that affect the growth or shrinking of populations. Until next time, remember that biology isn't just science, it's the way of life. See you next time. Hey, hey.